I would say that if you're looking at the 2015 to 2013 Tumblr friendly aesthetic and not mining the inbuilt political and moral presuppositions of the narrative, then you've only got a surface level take. And that kind of parallels how the game itself is saying, look at Arcadia Bay on the surface. It's a affluent up and coming town, um, except for the, the front where it's been dilapidated by the 2008 crash. It's quiet, it's sleepy, it's kind of wholesome. But beneath the surface, there's this undercurrent of darkness and supernatural terror. I would say to people that if you are looking at this game and taking the idea from it that it is very leftist friendly and not seeing that David Madsen is right about everything, mm. clearly you haven't played it properly. Well, yes, David was clearly the best character as far as I'm concerned. My primary concern through most of the story was ensuring the happiness of his and Joyce's relationship. That's, I was trying to maximize the wholesome family values rather than just give in to everything that Chloe wanted because I will admit at first, I found Chloe rather unlikable, but depending on the choices that you can make through the story, she can show signs of development towards becoming a better person, particularly in one of the false endings that you get at one point, which was rather heartbreaking to me that I wasn't able to make the conclusive ending. But anyway, what you say about the Arcadia Bay having this wholesome aesthetic on the, t on the surface and then below it, there's the darker aspects seeping through. That was one of the reasons that I was interested in covering this with you, not just because of the fact that I put Connor through Mulholland Drive, which he didn't enjoy at all and thought was an absolute head trip that he couldn't wrap himself around, um, and I agreed to do this uh, as, as sort of payback for it, uh, was the fact that you said that this was heavily inspired by Twin Peaks, my favorite television show, another masterpiece work by David Lynch. And certainly, as I was playing through it, there were lots, lots of references, just direct references to it, not just the fact that Chloe's number plate is literally Twin Peaks and that if you choose the, the bad ending, you could say, you get an, a direct throwback re uh, reference, visual reference to the opening sequence of Twin Peaks when you see a car driving past the sign that's outside of the town. You get that same thing for Arcadia Bay. Also, it was clear to me that it was heavily inspired in the narrative and the themes. Twin Peaks is also a town which is wholesome on the surface, very sleepy, has a small population. There's this thing where the sign in the show says it's got a population of 51,000. That was a mandate by the studio. They actually only ever shot it and intended it to feel like there's about 5,000 people in the town. Um, everybody knows one another. Everybody has relationships with one another. But on, in those relationships, there's lots of twisting and turning and dark twists between everybody. There's a lot simmering underneath the surface that you only learn as you go through. That was very clear. Then there's the Rachel Amber storyline, um, which particularly in the original is very clearly analogous to Laura Palmer. So in Twin Peaks, the central primary storyline is who killed Laura Palmer. In this, it's where is Rachel Amber? And then eventually, who killed Rachel Amber? I will say, just on a purely emotive level, the scene in Dark Room where they find Rachel's body gets me every time. Yeah. Voice actress is a very a good. Fantastic job with that. Very good voice performance. Yes. So I I also noticed as well that it's not just Twin Peaks it's inspired by. There are little tidbits to other David Lynch bits. Particularly I've only seen more Holland Drive, but the references to the homeless woman out back of the diner and, mm, and yes. And this this Honestly, nature of I, I was expecting the homeless woman to when I saw that there was a homeless woman in it, I was expecting, oh okay, is she gonna have the dirty face like from the from the diner scene in Mulholland Drive, I was very surprised at the restraint in not doing that. The interesting thing about the homeless woman is that people have suggested, and this has been refuted, that she is a character with more significance than she's been given. So when you go to, there's an Arcadia Bay police missing bulletin board, and there's a couple of people on it that she might be. Mm. And so that's most likely. The other interesting thing that people did suggest is because of her cloudy eyes, because of her haircut, because she has a very mysterious background. People were wondering if she's one of the Max variants that got displaced in time. Now, the developers have confirmed that's not the case, but I do think that would have been a really interesting little mm. uh, twisty bit. But, but, but there you go. So it's worth diving into the, the rest of the setting then, because the funny thing about this game is it was originally made by a French development studio, Don't Not, and it was written by a Frenchman, and then they realized that there were certain cultural incompatibilities that they didn't quite gloss over. So... For example, when you first meet Warren, they had decided to put in the script 
that she he was going to kiss Max on the cheek. And then they brought in an American writer called Christian Devine to turn around and go, hang on a minute. That's, that's, that's not, not what we do. No, that's not quite right. We, we don't do that here. And so they chose this sort of sleepy little Oregon town, not just because of their love of Twin Peaks, but because one of the writers went on holiday there and he liked the aesthetic. Mm. But Devine sort of touched it up a bit and augmented the language to be more authentic. And lots of people have complaints about, again, the sort of Tumblr-ish slang that's used. Chloe says hell or a lot. And people were saying, oh, this isn't, this isn't accurate. Did, did they go to school in 2013? <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the points that ER brings up in his criticism, which is that they actually got it spot on. Yeah. This is exactly what self-absorbed teenagers of this period speak, uh, spoke like, and what many of them still speak like in a variation. It is Juno-esque, and I know a lot of people go back and cringe at some of the dialogue choices in, in Juno and the writing and that, but it is authentic. How well the authenticity of it is going to work for you will be completely subjective to you. It didn't bother me that much, apart from Chloe's use of the word hella and some of the, you know, amazeballs, I'm go- let's get down to bidnes, yeah. stuff like that. I have a tolerance for that that I can go through, but it was still a little bit grating to me. Looking sick, Max. A couple tats, some piercings, and we'll make a thrasher out of you yet. Ready for the mosh pit, Shaka Bra. Maybe not. But I also noticed as it goes on, the story goes on, there is a bit, there's less and less of that, particularly from Chloe, because she is revealed to be actually a lot smarter than she lets on at first. This isn't particularly natural behavior to her. It's something that she picked up from Rachel Amber, as we find out in the prequels. So if you make the sorts of choices that make it so that Chloe is adapting and becoming a better person, you'll get less of that. If you make the sorts of choices where you're egging Chloe on to do terrible things and you end up getting her to shoot Frank and his poor dog Pompadour, which I didn't know was a thing until I got to the end screen of that episode and said, wait, and it said, uh, you went away with, uh, from Frank peacefully or something. And then there were the other options underneath that says, Chloe shot the dog. Chloe shot and killed Frank. And I was thinking like, how do you get those choices? Anyway, I, I started blasting. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's very strange to me, and it seems strange to me that uh, there are complaints that can be made with this type of format game, the telltale story-based games. And, you know, I, I, I have some of my complaints with this in regards to this game particularly, which is, you know, the, the illusion of choice, the fact that sometimes there are lots of choices that only change tangential things. They only change minor details or minor bits of dialogue here and there when it comes up and says, oh, this is a choice-based game. And then especially, I have to be critical of this game that the end choice is so pivotal and has the basically either way erases most of the choices that you made before. Even if it is more of a personal development for Max's story that the course of that week changes her as a person, I still find it to be personally a bit of a cop-out when it does something like that. Um, Still there is a decent level of choice that you can make to change the events leading up to that final decision that you make. And uh, those ones were the ones that really surprised me when I saw, oh, you can, you can just get Chloe to accidentally <laughs> randomly kill people here and there. I also saw from ER's video that you can get her to shoot herself by accident at yes. one point, which I didn't. And once again, if you're complaining that you're making all of the choices in a way that makes Max and Chloe utter and outright psychopaths and then you complain about their characters being psychopathic it seems to me on the same level as complaining that you chose all of the ro- uh, the what was it ro- renegade renegade options in mass effect and then you go i don't know the shepherd guy's a bit of a dick isn't he well you are in charge of the decisions that form the characters yeah and even the game to a certain extent is self-aware about the fact that max through using the powers in the way that she does is manipulating her friends around her in a way that isn't very positive. Yeah, so I've, I've got a few things to disentangle about that. The reason why I'm comfortable with the choice-based game having quite a fixed and binary ending is because the overall theme of the game plays into the mechanics, and that is that ultimately, are you going to defy fate and make sacrifices and be kind of selfish villain, or accept the inevitability of fate, grow personally, and 
possibly acquiesce to Rachel's requests, which we'll get into when we talk about the mystical elements of it. The game directors also turned around and said that something from RPGs is that a lot of the time people will quick save and then do something like go and kill a whole village full of merchants in Skyrim and then reload it back so they can get out of consequences. What they wanted here is to be able to explore multiple options within the story-based game, but have the mechanic be quite deliberate and still keep the players in the same moral quandary of well, should I be making this action even if I can get out of it anyway? This is Max's dilemma of being mm. quite a socially insecure person, a misfit, brand new kid, and doing small and subtle things but are quite manipulative. For example, forgetting Juliet's name, rewinding and acting like she always knew it. These sort of things weigh heavy on you and they have consequences for not only the end choice you decide to make, but also the in structural integrity of the universe as it starts fraying and fractionating and Max comes to confront another version of herself lost to the multiverse later mm. on in that horrible dream sequence. Yeah, it, it is basically outright stated in this that every time she's changing the past, she's basically going back and creating some fractured timeline, which is one of the reasons that all of the changes start to pile up and pile up and pile up and become the whirlwind, the vortex that almost destroys the town near the end. Although, well... well well, that could be one interpretation. Yes. The other interpretation is that for whatever reason, God really, really, really wants Chloe dead. And the only way to save her is to literally, like, almost ritualistically sacrifice an entire town to save her. Okay, it's not God, it's Rachel. Okay, I've not heard this interpretation. We'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, my main thing was just that, okay, it seems... that, that And that was also, um, I, I must say, also something that hindered my enjoyment of the prequel slightly, was going through all of these events and seeing the beginning of their relationship and all of the happy moments. And the, the game even does twist the knife in the post credit sequence. That by, was so unnecessary. <laughs> by reminding you, because I was being reminded the entire time that, oh, well, this is nice, but Rachel ends up dead and Chloe ends up dead. And there's nothing I can really do about it unless I kill literally everybody else involved in the story. Also prequel, Please stop trying to make me feel bad for Nathan, who is a, in the sequel, I already know this because I already played through it, a drug addict and a murderer and an accomplice to a serial killer. And a rapist, basically. And, yeah, and basically a rapist. I don't care how much you try and go, look, three years before, he was just a weird, awkward kid who was being bullied. Okay, don't really care. Stop trying. I won't step in for him. I refuse to step in for him. I let him get bullied, and I liked the jock who was bullying him more for that, because he deserved to be bullied. So it's funny, the reason in The Tempest that he plays Caliban, are you familiar with the actual... I studied The Tempest in uh, okay. college. So for anyone who doesn't know, Nathan plays Caliban in the reenactment of The Tempest, and Caliban was treated kindly by Prospero until he tried to rape his daughter. So Nathan is playing that resentful little scuttlebug role, and so he is a pathetic creature, but he's also morally contemptible. So I think the game's quite self-aware of that. Even though he's meant to be pitiable for how he's raised, he's also culpable for his mm. choices. He does almost wet himself on stage the second he walks out there. That's if you didn't help him, actually, with Drew. Oh, good. He gives a good performance if you stuck up for him a little bit, but then he ends up being a total scumbag anyway. Oh, good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I helped to embarrass him. Because, yes. once again... He was another one of these scummy teenage characters who's acting like a scummy teenage character would, just turned all the way up to 11, which is the... Once again, it seemed very reminiscent of Twin Peaks because there are a number of characters in that who are going to the high school in Twin Peaks who are involved in the drug business. They're dealing on the side so that they can try and make up some money. They're also... Uh, there's a very famous bit from it where it's a uh, Bobby shot a guy because one of the people who's a main character in it does end up like he's a teenager and he ends up killing somebody not in the same circumstances but it all is all very reminiscent and highly influenced by it but to get back to my original point that I think I drifted from was that in ER's video um, he says outright that he did he, he played about halfway well he played up to the point where Chloe is introduced and you start to get all of the dialogue from her and decided, no, this dialogue is not for me. And he switched the game off and then he finished it off by watching Let's Plays of the rest of it and then did the rest of his um, review from there. So I don't know how much he explored the options of how you're able to change and influence events as it goes on. 
once again, you still met with the binary end at the choice, at the uh, bit binary choice at the end, but you can still influence things as they go along. Um, so I don't know how much that influenced him that he maybe only watched one play. He also says outright that the game doesn't seem to suggest that there are multiple timelines going on. It absolutely when it does. when it outright does state this. So it's point. important to note as well that and we won't be covering the sequel comics here, but it's worth just a quick mention. Um, Emma Viacelli's series explores something called the transect, which is the world between the multiverse that Max learns to tap into and travel. So she goes to different timelines and explores the different options, and that is technically canonical considering it does factor into the sequels as well so it absolutely has alternate universes i don't want to make the whole thing a, an er reply video as well no, i i I'm, just very conscious of well, that it, it, it's it's good though to get these because people i imagine watching this yes. video will be familiar with that video that might be the most they've ever come into contact with this story mm. so i thought it would be good to clear a few things up there um, which is he also brings up the idea that time travel doesn't make any sense. And time travel, of course, is very difficult to write a story around that will be consistent because it opens up so many different possibilities and so many different questions. But one of the things that I wanted to suggest my take on was that he brought up that he didn't understand the way that Max inhabits the consciousness of the Maxes that she goes into when she changes the past. When you look at the photographs and you go into the past and you change everything, and then she wakes up in a time, for instance, when she first does it and she goes back and prevents William from crashing his car, William being Chloe's dad. Um, he, she wakes up in a new reality where she seems to be friends with Victoria and the others. And he, said, he asks the question, I think it's a legitimate question, what happened to the Max that was occupying this reality up until that point? Has she basically just killed and replaced her? And I, this is my interpretation. It seems that from my understanding, from my interpretation of it, because there is no direct answer given, that it would be that she is occupying the consciousness for a short time while she's there of that Max, maybe putting that consciousness aside in the same mind, and then that consciousness returns when she leaves that timeline. That Chloe implies that, actually, because when she blacks out after correcting the timeline in episode five, when she goes back to tell Chloe that mm. Jefferson's the villain, then Chloe, when she, when they both wake up on the beach, she says that you went on autopilot. Ah, uh, yes. Autopilot. The other interesting thing is that they are explicitly in this story alluding to a bunch of different things, not just Twin Peaks, but they've also said it's Quantum Leap and Aston Kutcher's butterfly effect. So I've not watched either of those. Okay, Quantum Leap allows you to hop between bodies using time travel with yourself at various points in the timeline. Okay. And the butterfly effect is Aston Kutcher's character has the ability to read his old diary entries and he gets a nosebleed and basically has an aneurysm and then transplants back to that time and inhabits different versions of the timeline if he changes that thing in the past. So the mechanics are kept a little bit vague. They're developed on in the sequel comics, but I think the more important thing that developers are focusing on are less of the mechanics and less of explaining all of the supernatural elements that are alluded to and more... How do you react when you are given a certain set of constraints mm. and how do you improve things on the micro level? That's why she calls herself, she doesn't call herself, she enters the competition of everyday hero. It's that you have this cosmic power in your hands, but you're still the insecure person that has to learn to be worthy of wielding that power in a responsible manner. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.